like this and, and turn them into legislative initiatives. Um, it is the only bill uh, that, that I'm really spending any time on this year because I don't go to the legislature if there's not something that I have personal passion in. Uh, not a lobbyist for Anthem, meaning when I go to the uh, legislature, the lobbyist for Anthem's requirement is to take forward the position of Anthem. That's not what I do. I don't go to that legislature unless I'm taking forward um, an initiative or a position that I have personal expertise in. And what I would hope would be relevant to the committee is not that I had an affiliation with FGA, but what personal experience and professional experience do I bring to bear that contributes to my knowledge around the subject matter <coughs> still at hand. And that would have been my inclination, and that's what I uh, talked about at that hearing. Um, I'm not a rule breaker, but I've understood that rule. I would have been diligent about making sure that written information was properly put on the testimony. I find it um, interesting that in a citizen legislature that uh, everyone I've talked to since this complaint was filed, and I've heard now from Representative Tucker that he didn't know about this provision, spent a lot of time searching through the website, both under the lobbying sections and the citizen sections, couldn't find any information on this. Um, the bill committee, uh, the chair, committee chair had no information either on this or the two um, complaints of a couple of references in sections of the committee bylaws and the committee chair indicated to me that he had not in fact read the committee bylaws and was completely wasn't aware of those either. So um, I, I, I understand the complaint. I understand why the disclosure brings value to Make decisions uh, behind the horseshoe of the legislature. So I don't, I don't refute that I did, uh, apparently didn't properly disclose in the written testimony, and, and I don't have an issue with that. I understand where they're coming from uh, from that perspective. Uh, but if you're going to have that expectation of citizens who are going to put their time in and come and spend time with the legislature, then get that information out. Um, if this had happened in a, in a, in a meeting in any other area of my uh, professional life, it would have been you know, two people having a conversation and saying, hey, don't forget that we make sure you do this, and that would have been the end of the issue. Um, it's a pretty normal and intimidating process um, for a citizen to walk, uh, walk into, and uh, I understand that the penalty is, is not going to the legislature at some level. It would be a uh, it would be a personal favor, I think, but I don't necessarily think it's good for the legislative process. To, to, to put someone up and, and uh, as has been described, use this as sort of the uh, set the example and put the shot across the bow. Um, if you want to make sure that people come to the legislature and follow the appropriate rules, make sure they're clear, uh, make sure they're known, and tell people. And I think the vast majority of people that walk in are going to be just like me, and they're going to be happy to, to follow the protocols and uh, follow the appropriate rules. Um, this just seems very... Um, Seems like a pretty, pretty intense process for something of this, uh, what, uh, something of this magnitude. How much were you paid by FGA? I didn't, I didn't sure, maybe the numbers were here, but I have no idea. They're in there. It's, uh, it's minimal. I don't, I don't know what it is. I, I don't even know. But I saw this. That some statement that it was minimal. So I, it's minimal to some is maximal to others. What's, what are we talking? Are we talking hundreds or thousands of dollars? And then probably over the course of, uh, I don't know if that's. It's in the last year or so is what I'm trying oh, to get. It, it might be 2700 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I hear that, you know, you didn't know, and I, and I get that. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen that you don't know, but I guess the part I'm struggling with is um, that I, I think I'm hearing a recognition that, look, hey, I, I, there's a violation here, and I kind of own that, but it just in your first few sentences, it kind of didn't sound like that. And so, um, I want to make sure that, that, that you understand uh, and that everybody else who's listening out there understands it. These kind of things, they need to happen. Um, and, and kind of going forward, there's a recognition of that. Because for some people, the FGA reference, it, it made, it made no, no difference at all. And from your view, you felt like it really didn't. But some people thought that was important. Right or wrong, but that's their view. And that's why we have this in the first place, is so that everybody has that information. You think it's important, great. If you don't, that's fine too, on all sides of the issue. And so I'm hoping is that, um, and you know, we can't 
deal with all cases or why things haven't been done for the last nine years or otherwise. We have your case, we have to deal with your case here. Um, and maybe at the penalty uh, level, we can assess that as kind of being the first time through. I think your recognition of what happened. But I want to make sure you understand, and by proxy, everybody else understands it. This kind of thing needs to be followed here. Am I getting that from you? Yeah. And I, I don't. I, I'm not I trying to preach at yes. you about that, but I just. Uh, I, I sense that it was. You, you were a little defensive when you first started, and I might be too. Well, I, yeah, and I honestly I didn't feel very defensive when I sat down, but after the last few minutes, I felt the defensiveness creeping up. Questions for um, How much time did you actually spend communicating to the legislature on this bill? And I mean by that speaking at the committee hearing, uh, speaking to them in the sidebar, speaking in the hallway, whatever it might be, and preparing their testimony. Um, well, I, I, if I if I remember correctly, when we did uh, when the hearing happened, I believe they used I don't know uh, Representative Tucker, Senator Gravel, we call this, but I'm pretty sure they used the three minute clock. So it was a, it was a, it was a pretty um, it was a pretty full room. Uh, clock doesn't always uh, doesn't always fall. Does it strike? Does it strike <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't recall uh, if it may have gone over. But I, would, I, would, I guess I would have to put the testimony somewhere in that ballpark. Three minutes? Uh, yeah. Um, I've had a, a handful of conversations with the bill sponsor, um, as uh, Senator Bradwick referenced on a couple of the uh, uh, work sessions. I was there a little early and we chatted a little bit before. Um, I don't know when I when I send the I send a report to FGA and try to calculate time and I uh, try to round up and I if I have was in a hearing for three hours or four hours or five hours I put all that when I send I, I don't know if that's the proper protocol for that so um, the time may be overstated uh, I I really don't know. Um, well, let me ask you, let me ask you this: Did you spend eight hours in one month actually communicating? Uh, with legislators on this bill. I don't mean sitting in that room waiting for your turn, I mean actually communicating. I, 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 I. How, um, you were paid a run of approximately $2,700 and you bill them for your all of your time, your time sitting in the room for three hours waiting to speak and all that. Uh, how much did, uh, what was your arrangement with them for compensation? Uh, this outfit in Florida, what was your arrangement for them uh, to be compensated? By the hour, by the... Uh... I, I do, I started working with them a few months ago, uh, not a few months ago, a few months prior to um, 2015. And I do a monthly retainer with them. Uh, most of the time I work with them is not related to this. Um, uh, so they, I don't know how they parse out you do, work, you do work for this uh, uh, entity that is not lobbying the legislature? Yeah. And is that sort of a consultation? Uh, uh, yeah, they, they, they focus on health care policy, and I have sort of uh, street-level experience, if you will, dealing with health insurance. So I, um, a lot of times that's just getting on the horn and bouncing ideas around on different issues or sharing experiences or um, uh, sometimes working with folks in other states that might be considering legislative initiatives. Um, so, the, uh, so the compensation that you referred to today in this hearing was for uh, uh, consulting work that was not lobbying up the legislature? Well, I think I think the, the 2,700, I think that is from them pulling out of those, carving out from those reports. Um, so it's taking all those hours into consideration. You know, uh, Commissioner Matheson just uh, pointed out what I hadn't seen, which is your lobbyist disclosure report from May 2015. You specifically list FGA action. In fact, you even listed FGA email address. So I gather those that may vote if they care to in May or when you filed on June 2, 2015 or thereafter, might not have been secret that you had some affiliation with that organization. It, uh, but I think it needs to be really clear that, that, that you know, there's no obfuscation going on. There's no intent to, to, to hide. I mean, uh, Taryn Bragdon is a name I think probably a lot of people in this room know. Taryn is the 
the CEO of FGA, and I met Karen, and he's been a friend for many years. Met him when he was up here in Maine. Um, when, when this bill idea was developed, he came. We sat together with the, to the bill sponsor. Um, I've referenced that connection numerous times, in numerous meetings with many folks uh, on both sides of this bill. And I would also point out that the opposition to this bill is largely from the insurance industry. And if you look at my resume, you may note that my real compensation comes from my work in the insurance industry. So, so not only is there not, I mean, I know there was a, uh, Senator Bratwick made the reference that if he referred somebody to the MRI machine that he happens to own, that there would be uh, an obligation to disclose that, and I agree with that completely. But this is, there's no profit motive in this, in this affiliation for me. Uh, advocating for this bill does not uh, generate revenue for me in any significant way other than my compensation for the hours spent. It actually goes in the other direction. If this bill is successful and it does what I think it can do, which is lower health care costs, it impacts my revenue negatively. Uh, and it doesn't put me in a great position with the insurance companies whom I rely on to send checks to my office. Um, you know, when I say this is an investment, it, this is an investment. Uh, to put time into, into these kind of issues from a host of different angles for me. Have you received any legal advice as to what exactly a lobbyist is on the main law? No. But you've been a lobbyist, I guess, since back in with your first uh, registration in 2012. Is that right? I think there was a month or two when they registered. Um, that's when I was learned about the hourly. Uh, you go to a certain number of hours and say to just register, and I think mean, they, they did that for me at MHGC uh, back in 2012 for a month or two. Most of the time, uh, my first introduction to the legislature was I served as the president of the Maine Association of Health Underwriters, which is um, the trade has their industry association, that's what it is for health insurance brokers. So my first introduction to the legislature was in that capacity, uh, and I went a number of times on different issues that were related to our related to our industry, uh, never was registered. Uh, you went at the register? I, yeah, I was never registered. Is, is this the first time you registered? I was registered once in 2012. I think this was just reference, I think, for a month or two. This is the uh, first time I've registered for any significant period of time. <coughs> Other questions for Mr. Uh Just to follow up on that, <coughs> isn't it true, though, that you were <coughs> have been active in this arena for a long time? First with Taryn and the Heritage Policy Center. So you're, at least my art collection is your name is out there, it's been out there for years. So we have a couple of relatively new legislators who are now raising the red flag, uh, saying, I don't know who you were, but most of the people in the legislature, staff, legislators have been around, know very well who you are, and you represent conservative policy centers, which they don't like. Is that, is that a fair representation? Uh, probably. I, I, I definitely am not an unknown quantity. Uh, so this idea that they're shocked that you're all of a sudden not telling them who you are is questionable, I guess. Well, the, the lead co-sponsor, Representative Beck, um, in the beginning, talking about this bill, did tell me that he thought my, um, uh, my affiliation be the biggest challenge in getting bipartisan support and see what he obviously was making a decision to sign on to the bill at that time. But it's a little different though because this was FGA in particular that we're dealing with as opposed to your kind of known quantity in the larger issue. I guess if I was part of that whole discussion I might know, oh yeah, Joel's one of the, you know, how that goes. Yeah, yeah. But the FGA connection was something that was at least important to these legislators here that they suggest that might have colored the view. My question is really in terms of what happens after May 5th. So after May 5th, before September 16th, um, are there discussions that you're having where you believe that your FGA connection was, uh, you made them aware to the people you were dealing with or that they were aware of it from other sources, as far as you knew? Like I said, I, I talked um, extensively with, with the Senate Chair um, early on uh, and, and throughout the process. Um, a number of the different folks, um, you know, the, 
the, the primary opposition has really been the, the insurance industry, and I know those folks well, and Chris with Anthem and um, Sarah with Harvard, so had multiple conversations with them and talked about working with Karen's group. Um, so I, I don't know if there's, yes, I, I'm sure there have been many. I don't know that I can say this date, this meeting, this person, um, but yeah, multiple any other questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, some general discussion. Uh, I think that this uh, violation piece isn't, I think it's a, that's been acknowledged. I want to make sure I understood that there was, in fact, an acknowledgement of that. And I guess the issue becomes what do we do with it in light of all the information that we've heard? Um, I have one. Uh, a question about this. I, I think there's obviously no dispute he didn't uh, comply with the statute in regard to disclosing his relationship with that other officer from Florida. But a lobbyist and a lobbyist, <coughs> uh, I read the statute last night, for preparation of the hearing section 312A, it seems to me to be very clear that to be a lobbyist or to engage in lobbying, you have to communicate directly with an official of the legislature in excess of eight hours in any calendar month. And if you don't uh, do that for more than eight hours in the calendar month, you're not a lobbyist. Uh, even though he, re he registered, which I'm sure he probably did out in the abundance of caution, not to violate the fact that he registered. And so uh, I have a question on this record as to whether or not this gentleman even had an obligation to uh, uh, comply with the statute. Phyllis, do you have some view on that? Um, I get the disclosure here from May of 2015 indicating registered lobbyists. Does that change uh, whether he did in fact engage in that number of hours? Would that change your view in terms of whether there was any need to disclose? I mean, could you not disclose if you didn't meet the eight hours? Of course, this is early May when this happens. Right. Uh, Did your defense that, oh, well, I had seven and a half hours that month, it's all, it's all good if it forgives the sins of the earlier times when you made. I guess that's what the position yeah, is. It's an interesting point. I think this, um, it's not something that I, uh, I didn't know the factual basis for the eight hours or not in this case. And, and because this is the first time addressing the statute, it's not something we've really, I've really analyzed before. Um, it's, it's sort of a disconnect. If you're, if you're a registered lobbyist, um, you would think that this 319A would apply, yeah, well, but, you, but you spend Neely's correct, <coughs> 10 not, minutes or 10 you know, hours. Right, you have no obligation to, to register until you've um, if that eight hour requirement. So, oh, but once you register, you're you know through the gate. I mean, that's right. at that then point, yeah, I guess that's the position. And there exactly. was there was compensation paid in May. Right. Um, we don't know when, but. $1,474 of actual lobbying compensation here as of June 2, and that was, I assume, for the month of May. Yeah. I don't know where that comes to. So it, it, it's sort of a technical well, I guess the other, could be raised. Yeah, the it's, other thing you, somebody could do is say, let's just case, run the risk um, and not uh, register and then have to deal with that on the other right. But it strikes right. me that if you're going to uh, go ahead and do that and say you are a lobbyist, that what the eight hours is not going to make it. Other thoughts? Uh, sure. Commissioner? Uh, to me, there's many participated in, in these public hearings in the process for a long time. Uh, I don't want to minimize the importance of knowing where these people come from, but the, the level of detail that they want to know, other than characterizing people in general terms who are lobbyists, is, to me, it smells of gotcha politics here. You know, this is invoking a statute that was passed in 06 apparently and has never been challenged. Uh, most people who are lobbying are aware of their requirement to make people they wear, most people wear badges. Uh, I was around when that the whole badge thing became part of the law. That was pretty controversial. There was no discussion that I remember about this part of it. But uh, so I, I don't you know I'm not sympathetic to relatively new legislators who don't know what's going on and 
want to play gotcha because they disagree with the bill and they disagree with the conservative politics. That, that's what really this is all about. Uh, so I am not going to be supporting either any penalty or any further investigation of this. So these legislators, just to kind of comment on that, said that the FGA part was a little bit different. It's one thing to say, you know, we, all, we know he's an insurance guy or whatever it may be, and you kind of know where that's coming from. You know that you're going to get to that filter something that might skew that way. Right? I get that. It sounds like the FGA piece, at least for them, they uh, indicating they didn't know that affiliation. That might have been something different. This is something big that's coming from out of state and so on. And so taking them at their word there, is there at least some piece there where it, it's fair for them to say, you know what, I really should have known that piece in particular because we were getting money from those folks. I, you know, his record having been established as promoting conservative insurance-related issues is what my recollection of most legislators are aware of. It gets down into the weeds and sometimes it's important. I don't see the importance of that this time. His record was well established up there as to what he was promoting and doing. It had been for years. And it was, if you were there when this was going on, all of a sudden appears on the scene a conservative policy group. People were really upset, really concerned about it. Now, there still aren't very many conservative policy groups out there, but at least, you know, they were there, as opposed to what do we have before? The Muskie School, the Equal Justice Partners, AARP, all liberal policy groups weighing in with legislators. Now, I, don't forget, I was there for 16 years in the minority. Let me tell you how oppressive that gets to be. And uh, so these guys were like a breath of fresh air, and they were very unpopular with the ruling party, the ruling party that had been ruling for 40 years. And so I don't see it. I see this as gotcha politics, and I'm not going to be part of it. I'm going to speak to that. Um, in many ways, I'll start by saying I agree with you. Uh, I don't view our role up here as taking a side politically one way or another. Uh, we, we didn't write the statute, but our job is to enforce it. It's here. It might not be a, a great rule. People might disagree as to what benefit it provides or doesn't provide. But it is what we have. It's clear as to what, what constitutes a violation. And, and it's our job then to assess, uh, one, if a violation has occurred, and then two, whether or not we assess the penalty. Everything else, I think, is up for other uh, other people to uh, to discuss. Um, that being said, I, I will share my opinion relative, relative to this. Uh, I do think there's a violation. Uh, part of me feels though this is similar to the person who has trespassed on somebody else's property and hasn't caused any jam damages. And do, so what do I assess? Uh, one dollar, one dollar fine. Um, to that, to that effect, um, I, I, I don't see this as uh, creating any harm uh, relative uh, to the public um, in terms of the actions of not disclosing the affiliation. Um, so that's that's essentially where I'm at. Can I ask a question? Sure, question. Uh, in, the, in regard to the issue of the Bible Ridge Coast, do you think the statute means if someone registers as a lobbyist, they register, but they haven't, they haven't uh, done the eight hours of work in a month, don't do the eight hours of work in a month, uh, but by the way, merely registering, that they then have to uh, abide by the three, uh, section 319A disclosure. How is or, 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 does, or does it mean in order to have to abide by the 319 disclosure, you have to have reached the eight hour threshold. I guess essentially, I think, how is lobbyist defined in, in the statute? Right. Defined well, by the eight hour. The, 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 the lobbyist, hour. right, the lobbyist, the means a person who, has, uh, who is specifically employed by another for the purpose of and who engages in lobbying in excess of eight hours and then you can so it's a hand. 
So it's right employed by the purpose of and who actually engages. So um, I certainly think there's an argument that um, fall out of that definition if you're below the eight hours. And I suspect that's it. May not be what it may not be what the drafters of 319A had in mind. I've not searched. Well, if that's the definition, then how, how, the definition. Are, how can we do anything other than that and then to find that he was not considered lobbyist? Right? And so you would be able to do all these things without violating the rule, violating the statute. Well, we don't have to say that it, it does include the drafting of legislation and, sure. and proposals and testimony. We don't know whether Ms. We, we need to go back in time to find out you know, what was his participation in creating the legislation and therefore it, it, you probably need a little bit more factual information to know whether or not he took over eight hours. So the eight hour question you asked, I, I didn't have focus. Well, uh, uh, John is correct. I, said, and I, I asked the gentleman so he, you know, how much time did he spend drafting his testimony and how much time, because that's all considered walking as part of the eight hours. Um, oh, he said it was less than that. Yeah. So it was, all, it was all things that would fit under the lobbying definition in there. I, 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 I wish I knew you where you were going. And, and he was, my impression was, first of all, I was a lobbyist for 12 years, full time, every day. Okay. And I certainly agree with the statute you should disclose. Every time I testified, I did disclose, and there was no statutory requirement. He would, he would be foolish not to disclose it. He was stupid not to do it. And uh, and I'm and I'm quite familiar with the eight hour rule because that's when you get eight hours you better be registered. And um, based upon his testimony, you know, I have a high tendency to prove that he was a lobbyist. Maybe he fought over the eight hours, maybe he didn't. I don't know. It's not my job to be his lawyer, but on the other hand, I don't want to uh, as a commissioner want to uh, impose a penalty on someone that hasn't violated the statute either. Right, whether we I don't think it should be otherwise. And, and, uh, and I, I, uh, I agree with what Commissioner Gusad has said. Uh, if, he, if, the, if he has violated the statute, it's a de minimis violation. And, um, well, that's where I was at. And, and, so, and, so, and so I agree with that. I, I, I think obviously there are politics at play at, at right here, but I don't think that comes to us. So I think that uh, we have to sort through that and sort of ignore it. That's the reality of, of, of life in the state house. Uh, but uh, uh, you know that, that that's beside the point. Uh, the gentleman either violated the statute or he didn't violate it. And if he violated, I, I think it's a de minimis one, and that's where I feel. Uh, based, based on the definition and the testimony that we've heard, you, can you, I mean, could we make any? Could we de even determine, in your view, that he was a lobbyist, based on what we have right now? Lobbyist uh, subject to the requirements of the section. I think I would, it's a hand, not a word. Yeah, I think I would agree with Jonathan. We don't really have very firm <coughs> facts on that. Um, Jonathan, I mean, we, well, we I heard just, what we heard. Well, there was just one factual inquiry. I mean, in, in the month of May, he reported that he was compensated $1,474 for lobbying. That's what the report said. And I was just wondering, would that, <coughs> if I could pose a question, yeah, right would right. that, knowing the rate at which they were attributed. Would that indicate to you that you... I honestly don't know the rate, but I, what I give them is hours. Um, I would have to look. Yeah, that's to all look. hours. Or is that lobbying? All, no, hours? it's all hours. But I but I do... Is it total compensation for lobbying is listed here? Right. It's all hours, but I, but I don't know... If I was in the hearing, I would have put the four or five hours that I was in the hearing. And that was a four or five hour hearing. So, as I understand it, that may not be accurate if I should have put the five minutes I was at the podium. Well, if you go um, by my understanding of the definition, that would not be lobbying. Sitting there waiting is not lobbying. Yeah, there's a lot of Communicating is on. lobbying. Yeah. I, I'd have to go back and look, and I'd be happy to do that, but I just don't know. I, I would have said hours, not, not a dollar amount. Well, I think we need that information, frankly. I mean, um, if you can't give it to us today, I don't want to prolong this any longer than need be. But it's an important threshold issue. Morning. Morning. This may tip the balance one way or the other. We could table this and ask the staff to further investigate. Well, right, sure. I just don't know how long it's going to take. Well, investigate the eight hours. Well, I think I could. We could reach out to the Foundation for Government Accountability. Yeah. Right now, in, in the interest of talking this today. Well, why don't we um, just, uh, we can move on to the next matter before we complete this matter. If you want to.
spend most of some productive time clicking away and getting that information. Yeah. That'd be great. And we'll move yeah. on to the next item. I think we table this to later in the session. Okay. So second. Second one. And I'll call in favor. We'll put this over as we deal with agenda item number three. And agenda item number three is a public hearing. We're going to make comments from the public on proposed changes to the commissioner.